Okay, good afternoon, right? Afternoon. Wonderful. I uh, hope you guys ate well, uh, but not too well that you're going to fall asleep uh, shortly after. That's what happens to me. Um, this is, I think I have to do this for the microphone. This is the uh, Communist Lutherans of the World Unite, question mark, uh, session Thursday the 17th at 1 o'clock. Welcome, thanks for being here. Um, I might have lured you here on false pretenses. Might. Um, uh, we're not here to create a new communist Lutheran faction. I think we have enough Lutheran factions uh, to be full. I'm not an expert on communism. I hate to disappoint you. Uh, my name is Adam Burke. Um, and uh, firstly, I'm a follower of Jesus. Secondly, I'm a dad. Thirdly, I uh, serve as pastor at Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church in Prescott, Arizona, um, uh, which is about 90 miles north of here. Um, I am uh, neither a Democrat or Republican nor a communist, so I'm just going to leave you guessing there, okay? <laughs> For today's purposes, uh, I like to consider myself just a guy who found some treasure in an old book and I'd like to share it with you. Just remind me, I need to grab my old book. Where are you, old book? That's not it. Here it is. So, <clears throat> how I got here? Well, uh, s some of you might know uh, that uh, retired pastors like to offload books, okay? And, uh, and young pastors, we can't say no to books. It's just uh, kind of one of those relationships. And so we, uh, th there was a pastor retiring in our Winkle, and he brought a bunch of books to our Winkle. A Winkle is a gathering of pastors. Uh, and I was rummaging through the books and I saw a book and I said, ah, oh, that looks interesting. And I put it on my shelf and months passed and I was just kind of staring at my books on the shelf and I saw it there and I looked closer at it and I said, huh, communism, socialism. And then I was struck by the name C.F.W. Walther. Uh, in case you don't know that name, we're going to get to him in a minute, but he is, in short, the father of uh, American Lutheranism and a pretty formative guy in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And so it piqued my interest. What is Walther doing talking about communism and socialism? And so I pulled it off my shelf and I read it and I said, whoa, there's some gold in here. And so I read it, I outlined it, and I presented it to my Winkle. Uh, and then I presented it again to a congregation nearby, and here I am offering it again because I think uh, what I found in it, I think it, it matters, and I think uh, you would stand to be enriched by it. Let's talk about you. How did you get here? I'm guessing you're here because uh, you are, in one way or another, concerned about communism, interested in communism. It, that exists. It exists in the world that we live in. We we are interacting with it, whether we like it or not. It's made its mark on history, and I don't think it's going away. It's been here for some time, and you, as church people, church leaders, uh, you have a special place in a lot of people's lives where you get to speak definitively uh, about many subjects. Uh, and so I wanted to further maybe uh, equip you and give you tools to consider as you speak with your people when you go back home about communism. I want each of us are called by the gospel to give an account of the hope that is within you. Our hope simply is not in politics and it makes us different. Uh, we serve the monarchy of Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Amen? Amen. So, uh, I have lots of info to throw at you. It might feel like drinking from a fire hose, uh, but you'll be okay. You'll be able to go out of here and have some ice cream and tend to your wounds. So uh, I promise you that the conclusions 
The things I hope we arrive at together uh, are very simple uh, and, and you'll have something to take home in your pocket. So some preliminary thoughts I'd like to cover uh, is uh, there are numerous forms of uh, social order and government, to name a few, monarchy, oligarchy, representative dem democracy, plutocracy, communism, and such. Uh, in all these, we admit, acknowledge that there's are in, uh, human institutions. Christians would say each, because they are human-oriented, are inherently sinful. But can one, can one be more insidious than the others? Okay, we're going to talk about that. What are your initial feelings of communism? Where did they come from? Can you probe the depths of your history your, yourself? And how did you arrive at whatever you feel about communism? And was there anybody in your life who influenced your position? Right? And have you, has anybody here actually lived under uh, the canopy of a communist nation? Yeah? Yeah. Worked in China for a while. Worked in China for a while? Okay. Any, any comment you have on Chinese communism? Not at this time. Not at this time. All right. Be careful. Keeping it, keeping it close to the vest. I appreciate that. All right. Sure. Did you, did you feel, did you feel uh, some vibrations from communism? Oh, yeah. yeah. Guinea, West Africa. Uh, the, the, the way that that society was versus their neighbors are almost like the U.S. states as far as you know, the blood geographical area. Mm -hmm. Fast, fast, fast. Okay. Uh, in terms of how it developed next to these, these nations and things like that. Uh, uh, on this question, anybody anybody pinpoint how they came to arrive at, at whatever they're walking in the door with, their position on communism? Yeah. Okay, but you mentioned firstly the president was uh, that you that you grew up watching had a lot of things to say about it yeah, back in the eighties. Yeah. Okay. So at a, at a camp for farm kids, a anti-communist yeah. lessons. Interesting. <laughs> he, I was not. I did not see that one coming. That's 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 a good one. Uh, yes. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just old enough, I guess, to where I actually got taught real history and yeah. read it. Uh, Woo. <laughs> and uh, and and I don't know what they're teaching nowadays, but uh, the you know what's patently obvious. When you read history, especially the, the horrors of the 20th century, um, although the the ideals and the um, intent behind communism may be projected as noble goals, they're incompatible with uh, human nature, and that's the problem. They're just incompatible with human nature, and so uh, you know, try trying to fit that square peg in a round hole just leads to disaster time and time again because people just aren't built that way. Yeah. You know? Okay. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any other any other comment? Yeah. That, that education camp might have been sponsored by the John Birch Society. No. I'm, it trying, wasn't. To, I'm trying to remember what I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> it's buggy, I can't think of the name of the group. Yeah. It was like it, it wasn't an FFA Yeah, in the 50s, we had uh, John Birch Society, and it wasn't all bad. Uh, they had some tremendous 
pro-capitalism, anti-communism, uh, classes, discussions, and materials. Uh, and of course, you had McCarthyism in the 50s, which took it to an extreme. So that those of us that are old like me, uh, people don't seem to be as concerned anymore. Yeah. And I like, I like um, hearing from one another of your experiences because, yeah, you lived in chapters that I, I did not live in. Um, yeah. Perhaps that camp you're speaking of, ma'am, was a reaction to the early communist, the, the communist movement within the farm community in the early 20th century, possibly. I don't remember exactly why I came Farm, farmers and day laborers were often a target for for uh, communist moves. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my my thoughts, which are, are pretty shallow. I was I was uh, born 1985. Of course, the Berlin Wall came down 1989, and uh, I can only say that generically, I was I, I came to a, came to believe that communist was just somehow a bad thing. Communist was used in a pejorative term, right, and. Uh, and something that was uh, un-American and, and inferior to democracy. And, uh, and after living mostly after the Berlin Wall fell, it looked like a failed experiment. Right? Um, I lived in England for a year. And uh, at that, during that time, uh, even though we were uh, visitors there, people with visas, uh, we were uh, allowed to engage in their socialized health care, totally free. And uh, that was kind of an interesting idea that's more on the socialism side of things or the government stepping in to take over certain arenas uh, within within the public life um, but, but that's probably as close as I ever got to uh, a socialized system of government and it seemed like the people honestly who, who were living in, in that time um, you know they they were uh, seemingly content with paying the higher taxes to at least cover that that portion of of public need, so, um, I, but I couldn't. The point is this: I couldn't put my finger on why it was bad. All right, uh, I couldn't distinguish between my cultural biases and 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 what is what is really true about it. And that's what was so helpful, and what I want to share with you about uh, Walther's treatment of it, um, because uh, he really just nails it to the ground um, uh, on three levels. Okay, so. Uh, um, I'm going to skip that one. My intentions for this talk is to uh, examine and understand uh, the outline of, of Walter's lecture, which I have outlined for you. That's the handout and argumentation. Uh, come to under understand the biblical underpinnings uh, for uh, rejecting communism. Identify the earthly worldviews that open the door for communism today even. And uh, discuss how we engage with our people who might be who might become in the future wooed by uh, communism today? So first thing I like to do this uh, I just really love figuring this out is do a com is do a comparison. Uh, we have two historical characters, uh, C.F.W. Walther, of whom we're going to be uh, reading and learning from, uh, and uh, you might have met this guy before, uh, Karl Marx. Um, he is the author, uh, co-author of the Communist Manifesto, which is pretty much the fundamental document on what communism is. Um, they're contemporaries, uh, and I think that's amazing. That within just a few years, both their whole life, their their birth to their death, uh, they're in the same arena of life, and I, and I, that never clicked with me before. Uh, Karl Marx was born in Trier. Uh, which is on, on this uh, far west side of Germany, and, and uh, CFW was definitely in, in the square of Saxony and a place called Legenschendorf, I think. Um, but, but look at their years, right? He's, he's about uh, seven years older, and then he dies just about, you know, uh, four years, four years before Walter himself dies. And how, how did two German dudes from the same general area, lived in the same chapters of life, how can they arrive at two polar opposite worldviews? Now, of course, there was a lot going on in Germany at that time. I mean, a lot. But uh, it's just fascinating that 
you know, maybe, you know what, what would happen if they sat down and talked and their lives crossed, right? So uh, some key things just to establish uh, the, the presence of communism in, in, in at least our modern history. February 21, 1848, the Communist Manifesto, uh, penned by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, uh, uh, calls for a working class revolt against capitalism. Its motto, workers of the world, unite. It quickly became a rallying cry. So it started out with this very important document. November 7th, 1917, with B Vladimir Lenin at the helm, the Bolsheviks, ascribing Marxism, seized power during Russia's October Revolution, became the first communist government. Later that month, leftist socialist revolutionaries defeated the Bolsheviks in an election, but despite promises of bread, land, and peace, Lenin used military force to take power. During this period of red terror executions of the SARS officials, uh, prisoner of war labor camps, and other uh, police state tactics, were established. Uh, July 1, tw uh, tw 1921, inspired the re by the Rus Russian Revolution, Communist Party of China uh, is founded. May 9, 1945, getting a little closer, uh, USSR declares victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. With Japan's defeat, Korea becomes divided and becomes the Communist North, which is still the case today, uh, which the Soviets occupied, and the South, which had been occupied by the United States. October 1st, 1949, during the Civil War, Chinese Communist Party leader, uh, leader Mao Zedong uh, declares his creation of the People's Republic of China, uh, leading the United States to end dip diplomatic ties with the PRC for decades. January 1st, 1959, Fidel Castro overthrows the corrupt Fulgencio Batista regime and Cuba becomes a communist State now it's in our um, now it's in our backyard, right? And from 1940 to 1979, communism becomes established by force uh, or otherwise in a, a long list of, of countries that I, th I think you have listed there in your handout, right? And colored here as showing up. This is a world phenomenon. Uh, it has been a very popular and I frankly think it's not going away. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to establish some definitions. I think it's helpful. Communism, as we're going to work with it today, a system in which goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed, uh, a, w a way of organizing society in which the government owes th owns everything. Uh, the personal property, the ultimate intent is for that to go away, that, that the government has everything and then distributes, and uh, the, the individual person does not have that uh, uh, in individual things, okay? And socialism, uh, very similar, um, but I'd say socialism can lead to communism, which is maybe the end goal. A way of organizing society in which major industries are owned and controlled by the government rather than individual people and companies. So certain sectors of the public uh, are, are, are uh, taken over and, and then um, uh, maintained by the government and things are handed out through them. Are we okay with those terms? Great. Um, so, uh, Walther uh, gives this talk um, uh, to some folks in, I think it was 1879, isn't that right? Um, and, uh, and the purpose for his writing, the, the, what, what prompted him to talk about it is he found uh, amongst life in uh, St. Louis at that time, a daily pepper, a paper representing itself uh, the voice and concerns of the laborers. Uh, while the young, young persons in Walter's congregation had made it their paper. This is before uh, podcasts, this is before tweets and everything like that. Uh, you, you would have a, a favorite uh, periodical, a piece of paper, sort of newspaper thing that, that you like to, to read. And, uh, and some of his youth were reading these papers. And uh, he says, these papers, they don't just or only uh, or at all j represent the laborer's interest, but is rather a disguise for communism and socialism. Walther wonders how any Christian could support such a paper and dismisses the Christian views, the Christian va uh, that dismisses Christian values uh, and that our true treasure and providence comes from heaven. 
Walter then provides anecdotes for the paper, uh, purporting Jesus as the chief communist and saying Jesus would support the working man casting off the oppression of the overlord. So he says, I found this amongst my kids and it's, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way into communism and so this is a problem. And so he outlines, uh, he begins to outline what, what it means to, to be a communist, that the emphasis is on no personal ownership of property, uh, that, that everything is pooled and it's managed by certain persons. And then for the laborers especially, uh, note that this is you know, well within the confines of industrial revolution, um, that an eight hour work day is what they're fighting for as well. Um, <clears throat> Walther says flatly, uh, a Christian cannot be a, a member of these labor uh, unions, these, these labor groups, because uh, they're, they're actually just a guise for communists and the communists are seeking to overthrow the world and its society. Um, they, they, are, they are a feeder for it. The newspaper and then the labor unions are, are a feeder into these socialist and communist uh, units. Um, uh, this is a quote I, I thought was uh, particularly pointed. Um, uh, Dr. A. Otto Walster, a editor of this German uh, unionist um, paper, it shall be our chief concern to show that man with his claims on material pros uh, prosperity need not be directed to any other world that he can and should find such prosperity here on earth. So it seemed uh, he's demonstrating that part of the Part of the communist interest is, in fact, a, a spiritual matter that, he says, we can achieve what we want here and now. We don't need to wait for heaven. We don't need, we don't need the beyond. We can do it here. Right? Um, <clears throat> Walther uh, references uh, um, the March Revolution, which took place in 1848 in Germany, as an example of the dangerous consequences of allowing communists to run wild, especially there in Germany. Um, labor unions in America are mere branches of those in England who fully adopted Marx's declarations of atheism and uh, are integral to the communist system. And just to reiterate, Walther claims, you can't be a Christian and be part of such an association. No reasonable man, much less a Christian, takes part in efforts of the communists and the socialists. So he's awfully bold, and so we want to hear him out as to what he's going to say. And so uh, he asks the question, which he answers in, in this series of lectures, uh, why should no reasonable man, much less a Christian, take part in the efforts uh, of the communists and socialists? And he's going to approach it in three ways. Firstly, that uh, men, uh, he's going to approach it from a, a rational position. Uh, that that it, this is, it's just common common knowledge, common experience, and then he's going to he's going to uh, address it as a scriptural issue, and then he's going to address it on a church level. So, men are not equal, totally equal. He says God makes unique things. Okay, right? Each look at each of us are a little different, right? Uh, or he makes unique queens, uh, uh, not, th things not quite like the other. Each person is uniquely equipped with varying dispositions. Okay? Some people are prone to anger. Some people are gifted in music. Some people are this, that, and the other. And uh, uh, the communist regime would shortly after declaring all people equal, right? That's why we should share everything. Everybody's equal. Uh, would, would shortly after insist, well, yeah, we're all equal, but, but you, somebody's got to drive the bus, right? Someone, uh, someone's got to, uh, you know hand things out. The communist uh, would reply, okay, okay, maybe, maybe uh, not everybody's equal in that person-to-person -person sense, but let's make everything equal in terms of possessions, enjoyments, etc. Walther's response is, is uh, there is no mental equality, right? We're not all operating at, at the same uh, speed and, and frequency. Not all of us like the same things, right? And when it comes to doing work, uh, I think this is especially pointed, is uh, uh, it's say, okay, you're, you're good at making shoes. You make the shoes, okay? And then you're, made, you're good at making the clothes, and so you make the clothes. And you, well, you, you clean the toilets, okay? Um, you know, nobody, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, that's, that's, my, that's the highest and ultimate good, right? 
So he says, he says that's, not, that's not equal either. That's not exactly fair and that doesn't work. Um, uh, one man's happy uh, by this means, another by that. Many a one thinks it would be dreadful for me to be in this man's place. You ever said that to yourself? Boy, if I was doing what that guy was doing, uh, even though it was a per perfectly reasonable thing to do, he'd say, I, I would not want to be that guy. Right? So it is. Um, and uh, he says, equal distribution of property. Let's say we pulled it all together and spread it out equally. You ever play Monopoly? That's how it starts, isn't it? Right? Everybody gets the same base amount of money. How does the game always work? One person ends up with all the money in the end. Right? That's a, it's a, it's a very practical demonstration that, that even if you spread it all out, uh, things will find themselves lopsided fairly quick. Okay? Well, hang on. So, yeah. I appreciate the thrust of everything you're saying. Mm -hmm. But that last example, monopoly is about capitalism, actually. Monopoly is saying, in a capitalist society, even if you start with an even playing field, some people are going to end up the winners oppressing the losers. Yeah. So I just, anyway, I, I yes. agree with the thrust of what you're saying, but that example is actually specifically about the evils of capitalism. Right, but he, uh, Walter is, is at least arguing that, that it will... If if you gave everybody the same amount of money in a communist, set, he he's, he'll he'll go, he'll make that reach saying if if in a communist uh, scenario, if you uh, if you give everybody the same x amount of money, it'll it'll find itself disproportionately. Um, there'll be some, you know, let's 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 give everybody five hundred dollars in this room, um, and well, uh, you not being you, but some some could go and drink it all away in an evening, and some of you could uh, uh, invest it. And come back with fifty dollars more the next day, you know, and and so it it can, it can work itself out, you know, any number of, of ways, even if you tried to kind of balance it all at once. Um, that's at least what he's um, putting out. Uh, man is naturally selfish. I think this this is we can kind of say, oh yeah, I, I get this D deeply Lutheran idea of man is naturally selfish. Yeah. So and I'm just wondering because this he existed in a time where the church really had a strong influence on the society around mm -hmm. and I think part of it is because men like that and, and people of that day were not ashamed of God's truth and weren't afraid to speak the truth. Everything that this man says is patently obvious and true. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I feel like sometimes in the church today you have people saying, well, you know, I got to be a pastor to everybody and I don't want to offend anybody. What's wrong with saying, you know, Hey, the, the positions that this party or that party are holding is completely incompatible with Christianity. Period. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how it makes you feel. If you're yeah. offended, so be it. That means that your opinion is wrong, <laughs> not God's word. Right? That's great. <laughs> that is great. Yeah. Uh, you know, he he's. It's great to read outside of your century because because he's he's uh, coming at it from such a direct right. position with some boldness. I um, just wonder if that's why the church today is becoming like more feckless and just like people aren't, it doesn't have the, the power it, it, it once had because mm -hmm. it's so wishy-washy. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering if that could be part of it. Great point. I like it. Um, so the, the next, uh, on the rational side of the argument, he says, man's naturally selfish. Uh, his appetite is, is, is insatiable. I want what I can get. Right? Every time. Uh, those uh, who favor equality uh, seek to gain something, often. Uh, who for equality would reduce their present circumstances? Right? That's, that we, we encounter this today in the taxation, right? Taxing the, the uh, ultra 1%. Uh, is so, some people say, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Let's, let's bring some money down here. And, but the rich say, hey, we got this money, uh, you know, and it's ours. So why can't we keep it? Um, Case in point, uh, the French Revolution. Uh, that's kind of looms large in his mind. Uh, there's several uh, uh, disturbances in France in, in that 19th century. Um, it didn't go well. You know, people people lunged for power, and and, there, and much blood was shed. If if you've ever studied the French Revolution, uh, what doctor, after years of education and training, would be satisfied being the paid exactly the same of an unskilled worker? You know, that, that makes a ton of sense. That, uh, you know, I, I went to school for all these years. You know, I, I, I put in lots of blood, sweat, and tears. Shouldn't I get something out of that? 
that is representative of the work. Right? But what of the Christian? The regenerate Christian, Walter says, works because God has commanded me to love and serve my neighbor and trust God to provide for daily bread. He says, you're right, the Christian is different. When it comes to work, uh, we should be selfless in that, in that aspect. We should be doing things um, for, for God-given reasons. Um, communist, uh, our man's heart is naturally full of envy, ambition, and avarice. These are all wild beasts which abide in the natural man and which the communist will never be able to control in his new social arrangements. That's, what, that's a great quote. quote. Uh, communes, he, he picks on communes for a little bit. Uh, communes have, he says, communes have been attempted many times over. He says, and they all failed. He, he tells the story of this one guy, Fourier, French guy, who gets together his commune and it's all great, uh, but, it, but he keeps reaching out to the community. He says, hey, is there any like, rich folks out there who want to help seed this thing? You know, get it, keep, all we need is a million dollars to keep it going. <laughs> so he, It's this ir- ironic situation where he, he, can't, he can't keep it going. Third point, in fact, happiness does not exist in external advantages. Uh, equal distribution of money would not make people equally happy. Fifty dollars in your pocket might not feel as good as fifty dollars in my pocket, right? Individuals find themselves happy for different reasons. It is well proved that man- money cannot buy happiness. This is born itself time and time again. God's word alone makes us happy, and the atheists are left to despair. This is what I think is. I put the whole thing in there. Sorry, it's small. I'll read it to you. I think it's just super powerful. The Word of God alone can make us happy. A man may indeed succeed well in some undertaking and become overjoyed for a time and feel himself very happy, but alas, it is only for a short time. A Christian, on the other hand, is always happy, even while he's weeping. And if he should be prostrated before God, he must confess, Happy man that I am. He knows that he has enjoyed God's goodness. He knows his tears will soon be wiped away. He will be with his God and Father and will stand before his throne forevermore. And once this delusive play on the stage of life has ended, how beautiful is that? The Christian knows this, and therefore he is happy. He is, of course, not always in a pleasant mood. Sometimes he feels very sad, yes, and quite frequently so. And, deeper, and, and the deeper is Christianity, the more he'll be troubled with his feelings of sadness as much as he, uh, uh, and as much as he knows, notices every action of the flesh. This will cause him trouble and distress. However, One thing no one can take from him. He has a merciful God in heaven, and he has found the precious pearl. And when this life is at its end, he can cheerfully close his eyes, for he fears neither death nor hell, nor that nothing which the atheists are constantly and continually afraid. What do you think about that? Good stuff, right? Potent? Any any thoughts uh, before we move on to the second part of the lecture? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It seems like the correlation is kind of, you know, you wouldn't fake it, but it just seems like the more, the, the greater the persecution, the more the grace in the church thrives, whereas the more the blessings and, 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 and the comforts, the more it just withers and dies, like in this country. You know, it just, uh, and all the places where it's just exploding are places of extreme persecution, China, Africa. You know, I mean, it's just, it just seems to be that's how God works, you know. It, it is uncanny, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, uh, there was a Czech Christian that said, God will call the comment, we survived uh, the theoretical atheism. We'll see how we do with practical atheism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Western society. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Walter, uh, that's all he does for the first lecture, the first session of speaking to people. Um, And uh, uh, he kind of jumps back in the next time they get together. He says, do not think that Lutherans do not know the plight of the laboring class. This isn't strange or foreign to us as Lutherans. Most Lutherans are a part of it. uh, Walter is is amongst the working class citizens of of St. Louis, I think, by this time. 
right? His church is down in, uh, I'm sure you've had to make your pilgrimage to St. Louis some, one time or another and, uh, and seen first, the First Lutheran Church that, that's there. Um, it's in the heart of it, you know, and, and lots of German immigrants. Anheuser-Busch, hello! German immigrants. Um, uh, we are enemies of those, he says, though, that abuse the poor. We're not, we're not indifferent to this issue, right? Scripture clearly teaches that we ought to love our neighbor and seek justice. We join Scripture in the cry out against uh, capitalist unrighteousness. Uh, we're, we're against all the bad stuff, right? All the injustices possible. Uh, but we cannot side with the communists or the socialists. The enemy of the enemy is not my friend in this case. Their means uh, in the pursuit of equality on earth, no Christian can abide. So he jumps back in to a fourth, a fourth point on the, rational, on the rational side of things. He says, uh, The fact is well established by experience that communists have never attained uh, their professed end and only introduced sorrow and suffering. He says, just factively, look at the books. Look at the histories. It doesn't work out. Right? Uh, Walther gives ancient examples. Firstly, he mentions Sparta. He mentions uh, Plato. He mentions uh, Pythagoras. He mentions the Essenes of the Bible. He says all these people attempted or promoted a form of communism, but eventually it evaporated. It didn't, didn't last very long. Good examples if we live in the 20th century. Huh? Yeah, well, we're, we're, getting, we're getting there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, lots of failures. Uh, and so that's another point he's making, which I think is fascinating from, from his perspective. And remember, he's a contemporary with Karl Marx. He says, this isn't new. This isn't a 20th century issue. This isn't a 19th century issue. He says, this is old. An old lie, right? There's nothing new under the sun. He says, oh, yeah, the, the communists like to point at the, the early church. We're going to get back to that. They like to point at the early church. Look at, look at they're, they're of course promoting. They, they, they shared all things together, right? As Acts, Acts 2 and Acts 4 suggests. He says, it is, ah, it's, not, it's not like that. It's not fair. Um, he says, okay, some Christians did attempt it as monks, okay? Monks living in, uh, in community together. Uh, they attempted it. But he says, he says it, 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 that wasn't pure either. Right? Why did monks become monks ultimately? To be one, one, to get a little bit closer to God, right? To to secure their place in the heavenly dwellings, uh, so much so. He, he says, fast forward to the the Reformation. Reformation had experience with it. This guy Thomas Munzer, okay, one of, one of several. Uh, uh, um, uh, guys living in and around Luther's time who, who took Luther's uh, ener energy and momotion, uh, momentum and ran with it and ran in the wrong direction. Okay? Part of Thomas Munzer's idea was let's just blast the whole thing, start over, start a whole new community and, and we'll share things. Okay? Even wives, he would say. Um, so uh, he, says, uh, he says Luther jumps all over this guy. He says, so you, you've, got no, you've got no backup with Luther. Luther jumps all over this, this notion of, firstly, uh, using extreme means, killing people and burning stuff down uh, to, to, to get what you want. He says, that's, that's not okay ever. And secondly, um, the, whole, the whole sharing all things, it, it doesn't add up. So Luther's on it. He says, Luther's on my side. Communism in France, okay? Uh, he gives a summary of the first French Revolution. He says, it's a failed experiment. It looked all glorious in the first picture, but really it was a lot of ugliness. That guillotine was uh, exercised, wasn't it? Um, and so he gives several references to, to various revolutions and occasions that happened within his lifetime, right? Uh, he, Walter lived for nearly the entire uh, 19th century. And so he, he that was this, these were current events, common events to him, right? Then he turns to Germany. Uh, he mentions three different authors, Weitling, Mund, and Grutzkau, as early propagators of communism in the 19th century, and he, and he quotes them. This one, uh, this quote is, is particularly disturbing, right? We'll either send a bullet through our opponent's head or hang them on the nearest lamppost. They will not learn to, if they will not learn to be rational, they will never say that we are right and give us their money that we may divide it. He says if, if they won't give it to us, we're going we're gonna to take it. 
And so, like so politicians' uh, campaigning <laughs> platform now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, Walter then uh, uh, talks about uh, most recently 1871. This is written in 1878, right? This this is, cu is current events. He says the last thing that happened in France, uh, you know, caused issue, and it was actually run and directed not just by peasants, but it was a communist movement in 1871. Um, this is kind of cool. This is an early picture when early photographs uh, of, of that time was taking place, building blockades and putting up cannons. And uh, famously, the uh, King Louis XVI of France was beheaded in that revolution, apparently. Walter summarizes that uh, any attempts at communism have not worked and have only left much bloodshed in its wake, all because it is contrary to human sinful nature. Okay? Any other any thoughts at this time? Now we're going to move on to the, the spiritual component, the, uh, the scriptural Christian component of his arguments, which I think we're most interested in. Um... So he says, why should a reasonable man, let alone a Christian, uh, reject the communism and socialism? He says, because the scriptures uh, uh, shut it down. It presents it otherwise. Okay? Uh, and then he, he goes at this by, uh, so the communists are smart. The communists like to utilize scripture to defend their own cause. And he says, but, that's, but I'm going to point out why that's invalid. First one up, Genesis 1.26. The Lord said, let us make man in our own image, that he may have dominion over all the earth. He would say that the communists say, see, see that? He said, we're, we're, we as mankind collectively are supposed to have dominion over everything. See, we're supposed to share everything. We're supposed to have everything in common. We're supposed to work together in the dominion of this world. Okay? He says, this passage acknowledges God giving the earth for the possession and dominion of man, but not how to do it. It doesn't specify. You've got to do it this way. It's this communist program you must follow. And he says, we don't have to go very far before we see uh, an interesting case. Cain and Abel. Right? What happened with Cain and Abel? Each of them provided a sacrifice. Their own sacrifice. Right? Situations were presented itself where Cain had stuff, Abel had stuff. Cain and Abel brought forth to God a sacrifice. It was individualistic, and God acknowledged Abel's over Cain's. Right? Early, early, early on, we have possession and the possessing of things, and individuals receiving honor or credit for their stuff. Okay. And this, that's going to be loom, loom large here, okay? It shows that uh, personal property is necessary in the life and the devotion of God. He says, without personal property, you would only have drudgery. Why? Um, because excellence, uh, or a, an individual doing something well, um, is, is, is honorable, is good, right? Uh, there must be good wine if, there, if there's good wine, there's bad wine, right? And how do, we, how, do you, how do you get good wine or bad wine? How do you enjoy the good stuff? Somebody put in the effort. Someone individually or, or, or in a, a singular group put, to, put effort and, and energy in to make it good, right? So if, if, you didn't, if everything was, was the same, you can't, have, you can't have the good stuff, right? have the bad stuff either. Personal property is connected to human desire for independence and liberty. Without it, you don't have happiness and incentive to work hard. Right? If everybody's going to get the same amount of money, uh, uh, have the same, the same place to live, the same everything, what's the point of getting up and doing the hard stuff? Right? And I think we see some of those issues in the welfare system today. The arts and sciences would disappear. Right? If you aren't incentivized to do well, to learn more, to discover, to go out there, we don't get anywhere, right? And uh, uh, if arts and sciences disappear, religion would be an unwanted variable uh, in, a, in a communist state. Um, because if there's something more, 
to be had. If there's if there's a good to be pursued, it's not uh, what's what's the, it is incongruous with the communist state. Uh, the next biblical issue uh, that the communists like to put forward is Acts four. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one. Uh, said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person amongst them, for as many as there were owners of lands or houses, sold them and bought them, for the proceeds of what was sold was laid at the apostles' feet and was distributed to each as had need. Communists love that passage, right? Because it looks like, sell everything, bring it all together, and, and work from the community pot, Right? But he says, read on a little bit. What happens next? Ananias and Sapphira. Right? Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira uh, come to the disciples and say, look, we sold this thing and here's, all, here's the money for all of it. Right? St. Peter did not wrong them for having personal property altogether. The wrong was saying, this is all of it. And they kept back some. Right? For lying about, uh, this, is the full, this is the full sale. Right. Uh, still, still others named Christians in the early church. He points out maintained property. Right. There was business owners, uh, people whom Paul traveled along with. It, it wasn't. It didn't stop being okay to have stuff and to run a business. Paul himself worked, worked to maintain himself. Acts four does describe an unrestrained manifestation of love in this extreme necessity of the early church. He says, yeah, that was an incredible chapter. But that doesn't mean that's the way it's got to be. It doesn't mean it's the only way it's got to be. That was done through love as opposed to coercion. Mm -hmm. right? So there's a big difference between uh, here's my stuff and out of love I want to share it with my brothers and sisters in Christ as opposed to I'm taking your stuff and if you get in my way, I'll kill you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you yeah. Yeah. Another piece is that uh, in the rest of the New Testament is Paul running around taking a collection for the people in Jerusalem who are now poverty stricken. Why did that happen? Famine. But how much of this led into that? Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is, it doesn't look like it lasts very long, and and they find themselves in need again. Yeah. Amen. If you want a modern day example, just look at an Indian reservation. They own it all in common, but nobody wants to take, well, I'm going to let the next guy do it, right? And when you drive through there, all you see is poverty, and for many other reasons, but part of it is because the tribe owns it, hmm. right? No, you know, not the individual. Right, Person, personal uh, investment in the yeah. thing, right? The Soviet Union, they had broken tom lines in the fields, and they had no incentive to repair them because everybody got the same, uh, same payout from the government, the same benefits, and therefore they had red lines because they had no food in certain areas. And they had shortage of food because they just didn't have an incentive to, to uh, grow up, you know, to, to do what it took to grow that food. Right. The, Walter does say, uh, uh, it's pretty interesting, I think, because he does come close to giving a nod. Uh, he says, uh, but what do we learn from this example of Acts 2? It's this, that a true Christian should be disposed in his heart uh, in this way. If rightly understood, every Christian should be a communist. In other words, a Christian should always be ready and willing to give up all he has for the benefit and suffering of his brethren, wherever the necessity, necessity requires. He says, yeah, as Christians, we should be people who would give the shirt off our backs for our fellow man. You know, that doesn't change. Um, but making it, making it happen, insisting on it, in, enforcing a system is a, is a different animal altogether, right? Um, next up, Matthew 19, the rich young man. Uh, Behold, a man came up to him and said, Teacher, what good must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, If you would be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, that you would have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard it, he went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions, Right? Again, the communists say, yeah, that's what we're talking about. 
But Jesus is, is now uh, um, is backing it up, right? Jesus he, was pointing out that he didn't even... He, he, he was bragging to Jesus about he kept all the commandments, but he didn't even keep the first one. Right. Because your idol was money, not love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. why he couldn't give it up, because that's what he loved. Yeah. Right. So Jesus was just pointing out, you, you can't even keep the first one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Walter here says that's that's the, fall, the logical fallacy of the particular to the universal, saying just because Jesus said that to this one rich young man does not mean that that applies universally to all persons in all places, right? Um, next one, laborers in the vineyard. Remember this one, right? King the king of heavens, like a master in the house that went out early in the morning with laborers. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Call the laborers and pay them the wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when, the hired, uh, when those hired came about, in the, uh, in the eleventh hour, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired at the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them received also a denarius. And upon receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us by having borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. And of course, the, the master, the, the paymaster says, So what? You agreed to a denarius. Right? So they say, Oh, this is a promotion of, of the equal wages thing. Uh, every, everybody works, everybody works the same way, and everybody gets the same wages. Um, however, he says, Unpack that story. Uh, Walter's so good at this. He says, Unpack that story. He says, Who's the who, what, why, when, or why, and how? There's a householder who owns a vineyard. Whoopsies. A guy who owns stuff. That's the premise, right? There's workers contracted for wages, right? Say, there's a free market saying, hey, you, sir, come work for me, right? The laborers, some of them work 12 hours a day, which is a poking eye to the, <laughs> to the guys going for an eight-hour day. And then uh, the master ascribes ultimately mercy to the situation, Right? The, the, it's true the 11th hour guys don't deserve a, a, a full day's wage, but in mercy, not in justice, which is purport, purportedly the communists are all about, is justice, the fairness of it. And no, this is, a, this is a story about mercy. Right? And you also have grumpy workers from the beginning. You know, so, yeah, I mean, if it works, everyone should be happy. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's something that communists or, or people of that mindset like to do, and there's correlations in our modern time with people that like to do that. But there, and I've even heard pastors, not not in our church, but pastors that you see on podcasts and that like get into this social justice thing. And biblical justice has nothing. This social justice that's being pushed now, those are like almost mutually exclusive in a lot of ways. I mean, they're not... But they, they try to make it seem like it's the same thing. And it's not. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Um... Then he kind of goes to summarize the basic principles um, of, of that Christianity is incompatible with communism fundamentally. And he says, let's take the Ten Commandments. This, this is my favorite part of the whole thing. Uh, let's take the con con ten Commandments, right? Seventh Commandment is... Thou shalt not steal. steal, right? What's the prerequisite for not stealing? Somebody's got something, right? Built in, right? Built in. Everyone should retain their own property. The premise is property. Stuff, right? Thou shalt not kill. God has given government to wield the sword. And so radicals ready to take up the sword without authority. This is Luther's great problem with all the peasants' revolt and stuff like that. Uh, is they, they don't have the authority to take up arms the way they are taking up arms. So this was the aha moment for me. This is, this is what was really a, a gem that I wanted to share with you. Is that God's commandments, if you go through them, they require possession. Right? That's the realm that God has created. Okay? All the way back to Cain and Abel. Right? Uh, uh, kill. Right? Thou shalt not kill. Why? 
Because your neighbor's body is not your body. And so I don't get a mess with not my stuff. Right? Adultery. Not my wife. See, there's a distinction between you and me. You have your wife and I have mine. And, and, I, and we do not cross that path, right? Steal, right? False testimony, right? I don't get a lie about you and your stuff, right? And then, of course, the covets. It's right in your face, right? Don't try to uh, get your neighbor's stuff or his people. Why? It's his people. He's got stuff. You've got stuff. And you don't, you don't try to usurp the other, right? The, 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 the very stage upon which the Ten Commandments are set is premised by the having of stuffs. And if communism, if you didn't have stuffs, if you categorically did not have something that was yours, we couldn't be obedient to the Ten Commandments. Now could we? So that was my my big idea. Um, <clears throat> not going to go there yet. Um, uh, they despise the teaching of eternal life uh, after earthly sufferings. Uh, they want heaven in this life, right? Over and over again, the communists are going to say, we want, we want heaven to come to earth. We're going to make things right here. And so that's, that's political promises today even, right? We're going to make it good now. Okay? We're not going to defer it to, to the next life. We're going to make things right now. Um, Isn't that really the core of how it gets so Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we, we can whatever is wrong, we can fix it now. Now, uh, not not defer in any way to anybody else. Yeah. And if you're an atheist, you don't believe in heaven. You don't believe in that treasure in heaven. So you're left with trying to fix what's broken on earth. What else are you gonna do? I mean, that's the natural resort that we're supposed to achieve a lost cause. Yeah. I think God gives them up to a mind that doesn't function because even if you're an atheist, you, just what you see with your own eyes ought to tell you that that stuff doesn't work. I mean, every time the government subsidizes anything, the cost goes up. Healthcare, college, housing. I mean, when, when does the government subsidize and take control over something and it gets better? Like, <laughs> you don't even need to believe in God to see that. You will own nothing and be happy. Right. And then when they further and they go on and say that, you know, you can rent everything. Well, that implies you somebody else own, owns it, right? We will own nothing. Yeah, we will own nothing. They will happy. own, the elites will own everything. Not even the elites, <laughs> the establishment. Yeah. yeah. Um, will own everything. That's why com, com, it will never work. It's right. because they act as God. Yeah. It's, it's, bring, it's trying to bring down heaven um, if, when they don't even believe in the heaven. Yeah. Uh, they're opposed to the doctrine of the man's curse, right? Man shall eat of the bread in, in the sweat of his face. Eat his bread by the sweat of his face. That you've got to work to, to feed yourself. To, to, uh, they're, they're denying that. Right? They submit that uh, with communism all men will be rich and not have to work so hard. Right? Yeah. It's trying to provide its own solution against the curse. Yeah. You would um, surely die if you eat the fruit. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, that, that's a and that's a that's an ongoing argument about how who 
to what extent we want the government involved in what, yeah. right? And that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a sliding scale of of interests, right? You know, I think we can agree. A public library is a pretty cool thing, right? Yeah. Not, uh, you know, decent roads yeah, is pretty cool thing, that we couldn't maybe pull off all by ourselves, right? So there is this. There's a there's a there's a dialogue going on, right? Uh, and it's active in the United States at least, and um, uh, and there's extremes on both ends, you know, of, of how much what what, we, what would we like to ask, ask the government to do? But then the government does like to run with it. Says, hey, yeah, I saw that you really like that library. Now now let let us build all your housing. Now let us you know do this that and the other thing. So it's. That, I was going to ask a question con connected to that at the end, and uh, maybe we can get some discussion there too. Well, I'm just going to respond to that. I mean, the, the difference is in those two things, money's not being transferred from one person to the other person. It's being used for the public good. Um, that, is, that is different than we're going to take your money and build your house. That's a different. It's just it's different in terms of the common good. Okay. Yeah. Um, Scripture teaches us that man shall not seek happiness in this world, but hope for a day where God makes all things right. To suffer now is absolutely ridiculed by the communists. Communists reject uh, that sin is the source of all trouble in the world. They'd rather assign all trouble to a simply ra lacking of, of right social organization. They'd say, you know what the problem is? We don't have so communists, and that's the problem is. And not admitting that we're deeply broken human beings, right? So I wonder that he didn't unpack the first commandment. Because right? it's not a trust in God, but a trust in our social organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who can, uh, to use the Luther, Luther's definition of a God, right? That which you look to for all, all, all safety and security and all good things. Um, that is the breaking of the first commandment with the communists saying our system our program, our new order of things that could can save us, right? Good point. Um, so, uh, on to his fourth lecture, uh, he then jumps over and says, uh, why should no man, um, much less a Christian, uh, be part of this communist stuff? Um, he says, because the charges of communism against the church and of Christian religion, which is often attacked in a communist state, um, that, that these that the church rather hinders than promotes material welfare, welfare of man is unfounded and unjusted. Um, so, uh, one of the common accusations of communists is they say, uh, look at the Christian religion, historically. Uh, they are often connected with the rich, the powerful, or themselves rich and powerful, uh, and, constant, and consequently also tyrants and oppressors. What else compares to the history of the church and the history of the most atrocious wickedness and the plundering of the poor, the bloody persecutions upon which those who differed from them? You know, as he says, so they'll, they'll point us and they'll say, you guys don't have a good track record of promoting health and welfare of the state because look what you've done, right? How many people have you burned at the stake? How many people have you killed on your, on your path to taking other kingdoms? How many, how many people in the name of Jesus have then run a spear through someone else? And to that, we, we get a little quiet, right? Because you say, you, you got us in a corner. The response, though, uh, Walter gives is, yes, indeed, under the covering of the church and the Christian religion, heinous crime has been committed. He says, guilty. It has happened. Absolutely. Yes, the church is often aligned with world powers. This dark history is that of traitors and enemies of the church found in her very bosom. He'd say, yes, it happened. Yes, it happened in the name of Christians, uh, Christianity. He'd say, but, but I tell you, the, they were not acting as Christians. They were, they were, they were false Christians. They were mis, misguided Christians. And that was all terrible and bad. And we should be embarrassed about it. And... Um, and yeah, it's messy, right? World history is messy, right? He says, Christ's kingdom in no way supports actions like these. He does not expand his kingdom by sword or coercion or oppression. So he says, well, we're sticking to Jesus' words when he tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. 
If it were, I would have people star storming the gates right now. But it's not. Right? So he says, he says those, those people were not acting in, in, faith, in faith to the Christian church. Second accusation. The church is proved incapable of providing for the miserable condition of the poor. Right? The church, oh, you're supposed to be all about helping people, all about loving everybody, feeding the hungry, that sort of thing. Yeah, I see a lot of hungry, sad people around, not doing a good job, even in these Christian states or whatever. Right? His response, Christianity nor any religion can truly do this. Christianity's goal is to bring about the right relationship between God and man in relation to a future life. He says the true core and content of Christianity is introducing people to Jesus and His kingdom. He says, yes, it's absolutely true that we should take care of our neighbor, but the centrality of the gospel is Jesus for sinners, right? Right. Then he goes on to say, Christians acting like Christians actually does improve situations amongst men. If you look at it closely, Christians acting like Christians, it, it does make a difference. If there are more Christians about, the world would be uh, more abundant with peace and equality. He says, we're doing, we're working as hard as we can, there's just not many of us. <laughs> um, support systems. It was the church that did it. In the United States, we have more now that, uh, that uh, it, higher education was created by Christian uh, Christian endeavors to educate and develop. You're right. And uh, we lose that rhetoric now, and, uh, unless you happen to go to uh, uh, Christ Church in Phoenix and send your kids there, or Valley Lutheran High School for us here in the Valley, uh, that is lost in the public education system. White people and, and Christians are evil. Yeah. No. And, and the, these arguments are stand. And a lot of people that profess to be Christians aren't Christians either. I mean, I think that I don't remember who said the quote, but somebody said if you were uh, if you were uh, accused of being a Christian in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Right. And I, I don't know if most people that claim to be Christian, they probably get off because there wouldn't be a whole lot of evidence that they were Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So Walter uh, closes his lecture with a final exhortation um, to reject communism and to cling to Christ and his kingdom. I'll read it to you. Jesus, be our guide then as we will follow him over mountains and through valleys, through prosperity and misfortune, through darkness and light. Finally, the eternal and blessed light will make its appearance and then our tears shall be wiped away. Our sighing cease and our eternal unchangeable joy shall take possession of our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, who has obtained this for us, help that we might secure it. Amen. So just to summarize, uh, Walther's uh, take on communism uh, is three-pronged. He says, uh, by reason, it is uh, unacceptable. It just doesn't weigh it, play itself out in human nature and history. Uh, the scriptures don't support it, even though there's, they have, there's been uh, scripture conscripted for it. Uh, it, it, is, it is not fair. And, and the church is attacked amongst uh, communists especially um, because it, it messes with their system. And, but the, the accusations they have um, are flawed as well. Okay. So uh, some closing thoughts. Um, it's fascinating to get Walther's pre-20th century perspective on communism. All of us here have only a 20 and 21st century perspective on communism. So it's, I thought it was very interesting to see him uh, as a contemporary with Karl Marx who kind of at least put it on paper for the modern world and to see him engaging with it in that day and time, right? I think we often see it as a plague on the 20th century. Those of you uh, who have more gray hairs than I do, uh, I think fought it more uh, and, and, and engaged with it more than we do. Um, but Walther sees it, uh, fascinatingly, even though he's before all of us in the timeline, he says, oh, that's just this age-old pipe dream. He says, that's old news, same old lies, and that's, that's fascinating to me. 
And then, like I mentioned before, it never occurred to me that in the Old Testament, in order to engage in the worship of the tabernacle and the temple, for example, personal property was essential, right? How do you, how do you deal with the problem of sin in Old Testament order of things? Sacrifice. sacrifice. How, do you, how do you do sacrifice? You've got to get a hold of an animal. And it's got to be your animal, right? It's built in, right? Personal ownership and responsibility is built in. Uh, similarly, in order to keep the Ten Commandments is, is a, a prerequisite to have things, right? Um, so, some questions I have is... Um, oops. Um, any questions on the content, firstly? Just so we know, I can have some satisfaction knowing that you understood my words. Yeah? Just a thought. Uh, yeah. Even the communists of today recognize that communism work. There is no true communist state. Mm. My wife and I worked in North Korea for a while. And the only oh, wow. way that the people are surviving there is that the government has decided to let them keep a little bit of what they produce, which then enabled them to be more productive in producing more for others. Uh, there, there is no true communist state today. China, for example, is definitely. Operating and true communist. I was thinking about that as, as, as I was putting this together again. Um, I was like, okay, well, who's still communist? So I was like, well, I was like, well, historically Russia. But then I was like, but they, they, I, as far as what I've seen, they're very, very interested in making the dollars and, and individuals making the dollars and and the Russian billionaires is the thing, right? Um, uh, and then China, right? Who's making the stuff that we're buying? We're they are definitely playing in the in the capitalism game big time. So it's very curious. I appreciate you saying that. And it's fascinating that you were part of that you're present in North Korea. Wow. Intriguing. Yeah. Yes. I understand after the Bolshevik Revolution, the, the communists slaughtered the, the business people, you might say. And then they got they, they realized, well, we don't have anybody to run this stuff to be able to make our products and grow our food. So we got to revert back to some, we got to get some help on that. So they brought in help from, from capitalist societies to do that for a period of time. So they couldn't make it on their pure cap on the Mm-hmm. Yeah. That so was within just a few years. Yeah. You said there's uh, three bullet points that Walter used to dispute communism. Yeah. Reason, scripture, and, and dispelling um, the, that the church is a, it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Those are kind of the, this three-pronged approach. Um, so uh, some questions for you. How does the communism of Walther's time relate to the suggested forms today? Um, you know, we've all seen uh, at least certain proposals of, uh, of what I would consider soft, soft socialism. Uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, is very interested in uh, involving the government into more and more programs, right? Um, universal health care, universal basic income, et cetera, like that. What's the relationship? I think that's the question. I was touching on the question you were making. The point you were making is how do we digest this for today in that... Uh, do, you we, do you look at that as more uh, as socialism? Like, I would really consider communism more of a form of government whereas socialism is more on the spectrum of economic system as far as where the money flows. Okay. Because where you were talking about like the libraries and the roads, I've had the people say, well, I feel that social security is socialism. And I'm like, that's absurd because you have the choice to pay taxes. If you don't want to pay taxes, you absolutely don't have to pay taxes. You pay taxes. And that is a direct correlation of 
if you don't want to pay taxes, you don't have to. Yeah. It's your choice. It is a choice. You don't. security, things like that, right. that you can't go door to door and ask individuals to pay for. But going back to these things like universal health care and things like that, that doesn't, that, the, the heart of that is good, but it doesn't answer the main problem, which always is the underlying issue, which is scarcity of resources, period. Right. So either, either you have a system where you get the best of the best through a capitalistic system, you work hard, people pay in, have insurance or whatever, right. and you get health care, or you have the government control it all, every doctor gets paid this, and we will allocate the resources this way. Well, your hip went out at 62, eh, we're not gonna, you're, you're at the end of your life, we're not spending any money on you, because right. they gotta allocate it some kind of way. Right. So do you wanna have that, uh, make that decision, or do you want the government? making that decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the scarcity of resources is going to be the same because they only have so many doctors. Right. They only mm -hmm. have so many nurses. I mean, right? I, I would so. venture to say if, if you're on Social Security, I mean, do you have a supplement? Because I don't think you can, realistically, the majority of people, UBI is would be very limited. Uh, all these millennials or whatever, you know, oh yeah, UBI would be great. But I don't think realistically you can think like that. These are not realistic. You know, like the, the commune <coughs> that you showed, well, that realistically nowadays is anarchy. It's Anarchy that we look at is not the violence doing whatever. It's living without rules. And it works in a very small group of people, but you can't have people coming in because you're going to have people that don't want to... You have to drive with the whole group. You can't leave because you're not used to what the other people in the world around you are doing, and it doesn't sustain for a long time. So yeah. Like, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you have your second question for comments go away, never go away. You you expressed yourself that you thought that it wasn't going away. Uh, you are a younger man. Uh, so what, why do you come to that? Uh, well, I think, I think there's nothing new under the sun, and, and we have a way of recycling bad ideas. Um, and and that, that, that just seems, it seems like a historical observation. So um, I don't think it's going to, I don't think we're, we as a people, as a human race, are ever going to say, boy, let's just, let's just not do that again. You know, uh, I think we're just, we're too forgetful. As long as envy exists, that will exist. Right. That's the heart of communism is envy. Right. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's. I think it's. It's a. It's fascinating that it's. 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 Uh, throughout the the millennia and centuries, uh, problem, or issue that's risen, a reaction against inequality and things like that, that people have taken up this this notion, and uh, I think it's just. Uh, I think it's a constant illness. That's my opinion. Yeah. But um, what I love about this talk is 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 that you is that you're we're, we're wrestling with with Walter. 
right? This isn't me dispelling my opinions. We're, we're engaging with a historical character and a historical document, and that's, that's fun uh, because he's coming from this, this interesting place that's not, our, that's not familiar to us, and, and we get to kind of push and pull and say, well, what a, that's how it was then, and it seems extreme then, or extreme things seems the things that were happening in his own time were extreme. I'd say they were, right? If you go to France in 18, uh, 19, 18, 9, 1881, not a great place to vacation, is it? No, right? It was rough, right? Uh, and and but let's dial it back a couple years, right? Certain cities and certain places in the United States got a little rough, didn't they? And what was the what was the rally cry? It's our, let's share everything. Let's take what we take what we need. You know, let's let's set up these uh, zones where people can get what they need. It was little little riotous attempts at um, at with with uh, communist underpinnings, right? Um, how can we as Christians engage proponents of communism? If it's not going away and it's going to rear its ugly head uh, on repeat, how do we engage, right? Walther, Walther uh, in a very Germanic, bold way, just uh, is tenacious about it. It is very direct. Uh, how do we tackle it? How do you tackle it? Just be honest, like he did. Just say, you're, you're, that, holding that position is incompatible with Christianity, period. That's it. I mean, if you say, I, 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 I like this, and God says that's wrong, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. End of story. So you can either be communist or you can be Christian. You can't be both. <laughs> yeah. Because, that, because then the state's your God, not, 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 not the Lord. Right? Okay. On a, on a kind of to extend that a little further, you, know, you mentioned the idea of soft socialism or soft peddling communism. And, people, and that's exactly um, what it is. It's not just benefits for the society such as, all right, we're going to give you a smartphone, or we're going to give you universal health care, we're going to give you this. There are people talking about universal policy because it's a right in some people's opinion. So it might sound good at the time, but it's still the same thing. The government is forcibly taking dollars from one person, giving it to other people that they deem needy. The government is the one who deems who is needy. It's not necessarily a fair assumption they're making either. And it all ends up being the same thing that it is communism in the, in the end. It might just be a different door to go to to get there, but it still ends up being communism. You really don't have that choice. If you if you develop income, you will pay taxes on it, period. Some way, somehow, that tax dollar will go to the government. It will be distributed how they see fit. It's still the same result. It just there's different extremes of different levels. We haven't gotten there yet where, where Russia was, where China is. Well, we are slowly heading that way if we don't change it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add another point. Um, <laughs> your opinion is that communism isn't going away. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Georgia Guidestones. Um, Google that and look it up. Uh, and uh, basically, it's uh, from the radio program that I heard. It's like, Pushing towards like a, a new world order, and the Georgia guys goes kind of list out this whole step process about how to achieve that. Mm. And um, it's interesting, you know, even in your uh, notes here, you mentioned people being reasonable, and that's one of the main points. Is you know guide everybody to a sense of reason. So Georgia Guidestones, another illustration of how communism. Is Whole movement and it going away, and then there's also the text of the Bible say that this is just the direction that the world is going to go in. Yeah, you're gonna say something, Vicar. Yeah, um, in, in relation to how we can talk to people, I, I there was a, a handle in here of the distinction between justice and mercy, and that you can acknowledge that these ideas of, yeah, we should all, we should, we as Christians profess that the poor, the needy ought to be taken care of. And that's our job, is to do that. We can profess that many of, of 
the, the noble goals of a communist or socialist ideology are indeed noble, but the enforcement of them under the guise of justice is an improper approach because of you know, what we've been talking about, this idea of stealing, it leads to violence and all sorts of other things. The reason that we as Christians are able to continue to hold to these ideas is from a position of mercy, like with the parable of the workers in the vineyard. The master of the vineyard, the reason that that was a noble <coughs> thing to do is because it wasn't a, it wasn't a justice issue giving out equal wages. It was a mercy issue. He gave mercifully to all the people. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention, and uh, I hope you learned something. <laughs>